uh, I will talk about Kumar Jiva. And uh, Kumar Jiva, uh, let me first say, he lived, he was active in Xi'an in China from 402 to 413 AD. So uh, about 11 years. Although the date of his death is debated, uh, he was living in Xi'an and he died in Xi'an. And he was born in Kucha, in Kucha in today's Xinjiang province. In Kucha, and Kucha is situated here. Here, somewhere. In Central Asia. In, uh, on, on the northern Silk Road. In the old days, it was called Xiuze and Kucha today. And that's where he was born. His father was Kumar Yana, who was an Indian. And his, uh, and his mother was a local Kuchian princess, they say, called Jiva. So the son was called Kumar Jiva. And uh, he was uh, born end of the fourth century. End of the fourth century, which is, notice, about a f uh, 150 years before Xuanzang was there. So it's much earlier than Xuanzang. The information given by Kumar Jiva predates, it's much earlier. So we know much more about early Buddhism from him. Uh, Xuanzang is the seventh century, middle of the seventh century, but Kumar Jiva is active in China, early fifth, but actually he went already, uh, he was active at the end of the fourth century, you know, 300, end of the fourth century, he was active. His mother gave him a good education, as any mother would, you know. She took him to Kashmir. Kashmir, she took, uh, the do she took her young boy, monk, to Kashmir. In those days, in the fourth century, Kashmir was the place to go to. That was the best place to have a good education. So that's where she took her son uh, to Kashmir. The road to Kashmir, it went first to Kashgar. And from Kashgar, the normal road in those days was to northern Afghanistan, actually. Uh, to, uh, and from northern Afghanistan, that is the old Bactria. And Bactria, Chinese call it Ta Xia, the, the larger Xia area, because the Chinese have the habit that when a Chinese dynasty falls, they move west, and they continue living in the west. Ta Qin is there, Ta Xia is there, you have Xi Xia. It's all to do with the Xia dynasty. They thought it was move, moving west, never to Europe, by the way. <laughs> That was a bit too far. Uh, and then so they went to Afghanistan, and from there you cross the Hindu Kush through the Khyber Pass, and you come in Pakistan today, in Gandhara. And so, which was Indian cultural area already, you know, in those days. Indian culture was from Bactria, from northern Afghanistan, all the way down to Sri Lanka. That is the Indian cultural area traditionally. So he went to today's Pakistan and then to Kashmir eventually. Kashmir was a Sanskrit study center. There was a, in Kashmir you studied Sanskrit. Before Kumarajiva's time, the Buddhist language used to be Gandhari. You know, if we look at the Chinese texts, the Chinese texts translated in East Asia, in China, from, from Indian languages. You, uh, roughly, we, we, we distinguish three periods. The ancient, the old, and the new. And the ancient goes from 150 AD to about 400, to Kumarajiva's time. And during that early period, the original Indian language was not Sanskrit, it was Gandhari the language in the Gandharan cultural area, which is India's northwest. Today's Pakistan and northern Afghanistan. And also in Central Asia, Khotan also used Gandhari, by the way. So th this is northwestern area, 
that's where Chinese Buddhism originally comes from. And it was translated not to the language of the Confucianist classics. It, it was not a Shusanjing kind of Wenyanwen language. No, it was some colloquial, more colloquial Chinese. So it was translated from a colloquial Gandhari Prakrit to a more or less colloquial Chinese spoken language in the first period. And then come, along comes Kumara Jiva in 400. And because from that time the original Indian language becomes Sanskrit, the terminology of Kumara Jiva changes. You see, because the original Indian language changed, also the translation changed. Kumara Jiva is the first real important translator of Sanskrit. He's a Sanskritist. Before that it was Prakrit, Middle Indic. With Kumara Jiva it becomes Sanskrit. So from 400 to Xuanzang's time, middle of the 7th century, that is the, the middle, that is the old translations period. It's called Juyi in Chinese. That is the, the old period. And the, 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 the terminology changed quite a bit because of the Sanskrit, the Sanskritist. And it, uh, Xuanzang brought some changes and he brings the new translations, the Xinyi, the new ones. But they do not differ very much from Kumara Jiva. It's very close because the original Indian language remained Sanskrit. So from about 400 all through the history of exchanges between India and China, the basic cultural Indian language was Sanskrit. Before that, it was Prakrit, Gandhari Prakrit. Let me just say that, because every time I come around here and I see the Buddhist studies and all that, almost all Buddhist studies departments in India are Pali and Buddhist studies. I'm always amazed, because it should be Sanskrit. Because the, the basic language of the Chinese Buddhism is Sanskrit. Kumara Jiva is a Sanskritist, Xuanzang is a Sanskritist, and they're the two most important people in the exchange between India and China. Xuanzang is, but please do not forget Kumara Jiva. He was uh, 150 years earlier in, uh, active there. So this uh, history of translation from, of Indian culture is a Sanskrit thing. Now the problem is Kumara Jiva uh, never wrote anything originally. He just translated. He was born in Kucha, studied in Kashmir, changed his mind to Mahayana when he traveled one day back to Kashgar and all that, so he knew his development, but uh, he never originally composed and he only translated. And he knew Chinese very well, because when he was uh, in Kucha, there was this uh, general who came to invade Kucha, and uh, Kumara Jiva was taken to Liangzhou, to Guzhang, as it was called in those days. And in Guzhang, he stayed for more than 10 years. He was not treated very well. Uh, but not allowed to leave. But he used this time to study Chinese. So while he was being captive, let's say, in, in Liangzhou, in, in Gansu, he studied Chinese. So when he arrived in Xi'an in 402, he already knew Chinese, which made him different from many Indians arriving in East Asia because Gunabhadra was an Indian, when he, uh, Bodhidharma was an Indian. Bodhidharma, you all know Bodhidharma. He was an Indian, that he arrived in China and couldn't speak one sentence. Uh, he, couldn't medit he couldn't meditate and all that, but he couldn't preach or explain what he was doing. Chinese would just watch what he was doing. Uh, Gunabhadra is supposed to have translated many texts, but he didn't do it because he didn't know Chinese. The Chinese around him did it, and he explained the Sanskrit. He even wrote a Sanskrit text, a new one, for the Chinese to translate. 
a Sanskrit. Well, so uh, many Indians, so-called translators, did not have the language skills to do the translations which are attributed to them. But the Chinese are very civilized people, and if it comes from a, a Chinese source, they say it's this, Chi this Indian who did it, you know, even though they did it themselves. Uh, but um, you never say, I did this, you know. You don't do that. You didn't do that, you don't do that, and probably, I hope you will never do that. Uh, so this is uh, the way it goes. But so Kamara Jiva conserved, uh, kept much of the literature he translated in the, well, actually in the Tas, that was the temple, the name of the temple in Xi'an. And a, a, a Cao Tang, a, 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 a building was constructed there, and this is a very ancient Indian tradition when a, an important monk comes by, passes by, travels, and stays in a monastery for a while. They build a thatched roof hut for the a temporary dwelling for the person to stay. And so that's what they did in Xi'an. That's why it's still called Cao Tang Si. But the rest of the, the big temple of the Da Si has already disappeared. But this touch it hut part is still there, Cao Tang Si. That is where he died. That's where he worked. That's where he died. And this, uh, what did he do there? Why are we, why am I saying it's so important? Well, Kumara Jiva wrote the Chinese version of the Lotus Sutra, the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra. That's an important text. He is the author of the Vimalakirti Nirdesha. Now, these are two texts which in China and in Japan are the most important Buddhist texts of all, of all time. The Lotus, the, the Miao Fa Lian Hua Jing, the Lotus Sutra, and the Wei Mo Jie Jing, and, and the Vimalakirti Sutra. They are the most important, also in art. You find them everywhere. So that is, Vimala, that is Kumara Jiva's work. So this influence is quite big. He wrote much more than that. He wrote Prajna Paramita literature, Prajna Paramita about emptiness. Uh, some half of Buddhism says all dharmas exist, and the other half of Buddhism says no, nothing exists. And uh, they were Indians, you know. So Indians like to discuss. And, uh, and Chinese make a text of this, you know. So Kumara Jiva was teaching, did not always have a text when he was in China, in Xi'an. Kumara Jiva sometimes just taught. Uh, and the Chinese wrote down and made a text. So many so-called translations are not really translations. They're just an Indian teaching how to meditate some something he knows all about, and then the Chinese write down, sit down and write the text. So, and they, of course the Chinese will not say this is what I have done. They will say it is what this Indian teacher has, he's the origin, and they'll attribute it to him. So many scholars now will think that all those texts are translated by those Indians. Well, in reality, they're not. Uh, like, but, Kumara Jiva is an exception. He knew Sanskrit very well, and he knew Chinese very well. So that's why his uh, translations are so important. He also, to give you another idea, the Amitabha Sutra, you know, Pure Land Buddhism. They have a short one, Amitabha Sutra, you have a long one, which was written 428 in the south, and then you have a so-called Visualization Sutra which was also written in South China. Those are the three most important texts for Pure Land Buddhism, which is the most important form of Buddhism today in East Asia and in Japan, in whole, all of East Asia. So he wrote the Amitabha Sutra, short one. Uh, it's a, it, it, I could go on actually, mentioning texts, and he was working in Xi'an, as I said. In Xi'an is, was considered the north. 
And in the 400, early 5th century, in his time, China was divided in north and south. You had six dynasties in the south, Liu Chao in the south, and you had many more in the north. So there was this north-south split. And he was working in the north. But his work immediately went south. And the most important texts also used in the south were Kumara Jivas. This is a quite extraordinary because we only see this once more happening when Paramartha, the man from Avanti, not far from here, went uh, to South China and worked there. Uh, but his text did not go north. His, so Kumara Jiva worked in the north, but his influence was also very thorough in the south. And after unification, when China unif is unified in the Sui, in and, and the Tang Dynasty in fi 589, that's when the unification happens. And then this is only a short dynasty. And then the real big dynasty follows the Tang in 618. And when China unifies, the translations by Kumara Jiva are spread all over. And everybody knows him. And then Xuanzang comes also in Xi'an. Uh, and gives new versions, some new terminology. And Kumara Jiva and Xuanzang, both of them, are in China the most important translators of all time. Those two. Kumara Jiva, Kumara Jiva in Chinese, Jiu Mo Lo Shi. Jiu Mo Lo, uh, lo Shi. Uh, well, Jiu Mo is Xing Jiu Mo Ming Lo Shi. Okay? He's uh, a. Uh, uh, yes, but. Even Du Moloshu, it's as if this is a Chinese surname and given name. Du is from the India Palace. Yes, and that's. Also from the Chinese Palace. Well, Loshu, not Lo, Lo, Shu is the name from his mother. <laughs> you know, his mother was Jiva. Uh, so actually, Du Mo, Xing Du Mo, Ming Loshu. Jumo Lo is his father, and the Shi is the mother. But uh, it's always with Indian names, even if you ha only have sound. For example, I'll give you another example Sangadeva. Sangadeva is Sang Chie Ti Po. Ming Sang Chie, Sing Sang Chie, Ming Ti Po. Sangabhadra, Ming Sang Chie, Ming Pa Po. So there, even in sound translation, they call Chinese call it yin yi, you know, sound translation. And you have you have yi yi meaning translations. And you have yin yi. You have the sound translations, and the sound translations give the Indian sounds. But even in such a case, the Chinese consider this name to be a real possible surname, a family name, plus a given name. This is maybe good. But I don't need a passport anymore now. It is, it is, it is, but, but it's good to, they need a, you know, so you have a, a, a family name, a surname, and, a, and also a given, even if it's a sound. Because that means if uh, Sangha Varman is Sang Chie, that's Sangha, and Varman would be Pamo. Pamo, even though, but Pamo is just a var. V A R. Because the, if you give more, then it cannot be a good Chinese name anymore. So the remaining of part of the Varman is n the man is not mentioned anymore. It's just Pamo or Pole, also possible. Pole is also Var. So uh, you have to know this. Actually, I only found this out a couple of years ago. <laughs> Before that, I made. I also thought this name is just one phonetic rendering, but actually, Chinese make a real Chinese name out of that, you know, and this explains many Indian original names of so-called translators in in China. This is a well. I, I, I'm because too many. I'm not going to bore to bore you too long with all those things, but uh, maybe the second. Um, this is, uh, well, before Kumarajiva, actually. 
this is a third century. But uh, Kucha is here, right? Kashgar is there. Shula. Kashgar is there. Kucha Chutsa, as it's called in those days, is here. Uh, you have uh, Lolan. Lolan is Kroraina. Kroraina is uh, here. Kroraina. And the art of Lolan very often comes from Milan. Milan. Mi Milan is cultural center. And much of the art which you find in Lolan comes from Milan, actually. Milan was the center of Shan Shan. Shan Shan, uh, it goes all the way from Lolan to the border of the area of Kotan, to the, to, to the Keria River, to the Keria River. There's a river there, the Yutianghe, there's a, a river there. And this is Shan Shan area. This today, Nia Jingjue is an old name. Today we would call it Minfeng. Yes, uh, that's here. So this Shan Shan, in uh, Kumara Jiva's time, you still had Shan Shan. Shan Shan was beaten by Pei Wei in the middle of the fifth century, around 450. And it, at that moment, uh, the capital of the Pei Wei was moved from Pingcheng, from Ta Tong to Luoyang. You see? Uh, so, you're from the Yungang. Yungang? Shanxi. <laughs> so that was the capital of Pei Wei. <laughs> so, uh, so that's Pei Wei. But it was moved from that home, called Pingcheng in those days. It was called, it moved to Luoyang. To be closer to Central Asia, to be closer to Shanshan, which they had beaten in 450 around that. So many Indians entered China by that day. And they all were Sanskritists, by the way. It is Bodhiruchi, Gunab Gunabhadra, Shikshananda, uh, Ratnamati. So many people uh, entered, uh, entered Luoyang in those days because Central Asia was quite Chinese at that time. So in the north, Turfan, Yenchi is not that important, called Kucha is, and Kashgar is, of course. Kothan is a different story. Kothan is very much linked with the northwestern area, with the Gandharan area, with Gandhara. And the history of Buddhism in Kothan, interesting subject, but not the subject of tonight. Uh, so there are so many interesting things here that actually I could go on forever, actually. I'm not going to do it. Yes. Here you have uh, some representations of in uh, Kizil, Kizilkom Kuzer, in uh, not far from Kucha. You the Kuzer Tianfotong, the and there you have the Japanese made this statue. I I don't like it. I I think he looks like Spock. <laughs> <laughs> in in Star Trek, you know. Look at his ears. I I don't. I don't think it's successful. Uh, it's uh, actually, if you, oh, well, he looks like an ascetic kind of person, right? Thin and mm, pure thinking, but actually, yes, yes, that. But even the thinker was looked more like Kumara Jiva, I think. <laughs> it's uh, it is because. Uh, he, According to his reputation, Kumara Jiva liked life. He was very much alive. He, uh, he ate well, he had many friends. He was a very social kind of person. Uh, so not this kind of ascetic kind of person, you know. He was much more alive. But I like this photograph because you have the trees which are so reminiscent of Xinjiang, you know. Usually uh, only present this, the image, and then you don't see the trees. But to have a, the correct impression of the whole environment in, in Kitzel, this is a good example of that. It's a Japanese one who said, who, who made it. Yes? This is from uh, the side, and you see the Kitzel caves in the back. Kitzel is a very... Uh, well, it's being studied and studied and studied. Kocha, there, 
in, in Kagushi in Beida today, there is an Italian professor in, in the University of Beijing in archaeology. There is an, an Italian professor who has been living in that area for a couple of years, and he's teaching it in Beida. There is uh, Li Chongfeng, another professor, uh, who is studying this. Uh, it's a very important area. And, and Buddhism, where does it come from, B Buddhism in Kucha? It probably comes from Kashgar, and then it probably comes from Tasha, from northern Afghanistan. That is, and in northern Afghanistan, the Persian influence was very deep. So, uh, Kushanas were, the religion of the Kushanas was Persian, was the uh, sun and fire. They were not Buddhists. They supported Buddhism, but they supported everything. But they supported Buddhism, so the, the Buddhist thinks he, this Kanishka is a, is a second Ashoka, but it's not true. His own religion was a, a Persian cult, and he also liked Buddhism, as he liked everything. So this, uh, so the early phase is very much influenced by Persian culture, and then later, it uh, less and less actually. So the, the where do the cultural influences in in Kitzel in Kitzel come from? Now uh, in Germany in Munich they're teaching a whole year in an art course about uh, the art of of Kucha and. And, and Kizil Caves. Uh, today, it's actually the Kizil Caves is in Baicheng, Baicheng, White City. The Baich, uh, it's a bit. It's outside of of Kucha, and it's in another Xian, another district called Baicheng. Do, do we have some examples of wall paintings? There, you see some. Uh, these are just examples of the wall paintings. Uh, they come from Persia, influence, and yes, and this you see the ornaments, and I like especially the next one, this one. You know, this is Mahakashapa. Mahakashapa is well, usually Chinese say Jaye, Jaye, but no, but I but I found that this Ye meaning leaf. This year has an ancient pronunciation, a different pronunciation. Pronunciation is sh. So it should be jia sh, not jia ye. And if it's pronounced jia sh, it's already closer to ka shap, right? So ka shap is jia sh. But the tra this is not a common translation, the uh, pronunciation for ye. So most Chinese say jia ye. And actually, I have been saying the same thing for, for many, many years until I found that I had to correct my ways. And now I will say in the future, Jasher, which is closer to Kashap. And he's uh, the founder of uh, Zen Buddhism, for instance. Chan Zong comes from him. He's, uh, you see the influence, he's uh, the blue color. He, he, clearly, he could be Persian. He could be. Uh, and in Kizil, that would not be surprising at all. I'm even surprised he does not have an earring. Could have. You know. And that was it, right? Oh, this, yeah, we have to kill him first. Yes. <laughs> this is Kumara Jiva's Sherida Stupa. Is uh, in 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 Xi'an the Cao Tangzi his his relics are after he was cremated. You still find it, and this his relics are inside. This is a stupa. Uh, a stupa normally consists of five elements because our body also is made up of five elements. The heaviest being earth. That's at the bottom. And then water is a bit lighter, and fire is even so. It goes from heavy to lighter, and we those five elements which make up our body uh, are also seen in the stupa, because this is supposed to contain a cremated body. Yes, the the shuri, the the shuri, and and which means body in in Chinese. So this is supposed to be there. By the way, the local people. 
think that everything was cremated except his tongue. You know, his tongue is still there. Don't dig near this stupa or you'll hurt his tongue. Why? It puzzled me a long time why only his tongue would survive. Why would the locals say only the tongue? Now, my hypothesis is that surely, sure can be the tongue, if you pronounce it. If you write it, it's a bit different, yes? But if you pronounce it, it is, can be the tongue. And, and Lee is sharp. Surely, Lee can be sharp. So his, he had a sharp tongue. You know, he, he, he liked to live and he had a sharp tongue. So the locals interpreting, not understanding the word surely as sharida, thought it meant something, namely sh the tongue is sharp. His tongue is sharp, and that's why his tongue is still there. You know, he had such a sharp tongue that it didn't burn. It is still found there. So it's uh, the local belief, hearing the word surely, which gave rise to this folklore, let's call it, that his tongue is still there near the Tsao tongue. So this is a, let me just also say that Kumara Jiva recently has been in, the, in Delhi, some IGNCA meeting organized by Lokesh Chandra was there and Supriya, Dr. Supriya Rai was there. There was a big Kumara Jiva meeting some years ago in IGNCA in Delhi. There was a Kumara Jiva meeting in Malaysia recently. There will be one in Shandong this year, in Geze, uh, and uh, end of this year, I was, I'm told. So Kumara Jiva is reinstated and he's getting the respect he really deserves. It's, uh, and many Indians don't even know his name. Uh, and I think that's a pity. It's a pity that because Kumara Jiva is very well known in Japan, where they do call, well, where Losha is pronounced Raju. Uh, the Indo, the China's Japan habit is to refer to someone with his given name, not the surname. According to where I come from, that's not polite, you know. You call someone by the surname. Mr. Mr. Johnson, yes, Mr. Whatever. You don't call him John or whatever. But there is in East Asia, China, Japan, you refer him to so you refer you call someone with a given name. So Loshu would be Raju. Uh, Sangche Tipo would be Tipo. Tipo in China, Daiba in Japan. Uh, so those things. There are so many more details which are interesting to know, and I guess this is the end. So, uh, with the death of Kumara Jiva in 413, we, uh, some people say 409, some people say 412. There is one thing I have learned in Buddhist studies. We never work with certainties. <laughs> we always work with probabilities and maybes, and likelihoods, probably like that, Abs very unlikely like that. It's, uh, you, you don't work with proof. When a scholar asks me, what you say, do you have proof? And then I just walk away, because you, uh, what, what can you say to someone who wants proof? Because there is no proof in life. It's just the uh, probabilities, or likelihoods. And if your explanation works if your explanation explains many things it's like possibly true <laughs> yes uh, it's only the, those people who the people who ask for proof probably do not understand it you know that's why they ask for proof because if you have a few elements which you understand you can draw a conclusion yes every analyst of any situation knows that you see a few clues here and there and you make a mental picture, yes? It's not, you, don't, you cannot prove that, but you have a good idea of what it's like. And if anybody want, wants proof, that means still doesn't get it, you know? It's, uh, 
It's those are the ones who won't prove in Buddhist studies and probably in other studies too, but I cannot speak for that. In Buddhist studies, no proof, only likelihoods and degrees of possibility. This is what I have learned uh, in all those years of Buddhist studies in China and in India. Thank you very much. <laughs>